This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. It is truly my great honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Deb Cotto. She's not only a good friend, but she's also a wonderful colleague. Dr. Cotto is a board-certified internist with extensive clinical and research expertise in osteoporosis and geriatric medicine. She is professor of medicine here at UCSD. She's deputy director of clinical research and education at the Stein Institute. And she's also clinical director of UC San Diego's Osteoporosis Clinic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Deb Cotto. Thank you so much, Danielle, for a wonderful introduction. Tonight, instead of talking about spinal changes of aging, which I did the first time, I will be spending the evening talking about osteoporosis and how to place it into the context of aging and, and talking about an individual and their decisions and how uh, they wish to pro uh, proceed with their care. Because of tonight, I will be speaking about particular drugs that are used to treat osteoporosis. I want to be clear that I have some disclosures to make. I have either received grant funding, uh, speaker's fees, or serve on consulting boards for the following companies that you see on the slide. So in the next uh, hour or so, I will be talking about osteoporosis, first beginning with defining the problem. What is it, in case anybody here doesn't know what it is? And um, then talk about osteoporosis in 2016. Um, why are so many people not being diagnosed and why are they not being treated? To better understand that, one has to put osteoporosis into perspective, both as a public health problem as well as where it fits in with respect to other diseases and health priorities. Then I'll move on to fracture prevention. What are the things that one can do to prevent the fracture? And as director of the osteoporosis clinic and having patients coming to see me every week, that's exactly why they should come to see, is to prevent the fracture. That's the purpose. We'll go on to non-prescription medications, particularly calcium, and what to do about calcium supplementation prescription medications, then some of you who keep up and come to osteoporosis lecture after osteoporosis lecture talk about possible promising new treatments on the horizon, including some that are undergoing FDA approval right now. And finally, I, I want to be able to finish with a geriatrician's perspective, because that is really how I practice medicine uh, and was trained in geriatrics. And in case people don't know what that means, it's treating people who are older. And because of Germany, we call that over age 65. But uh, my friend, who just came to become the new division chief here in geriatrics at UCSD, is questioning whether that is the right age that we should be using. So. What is osteoporosis? Well, you can see from this web-derived picture that it means porous bones, uh, derived from the Greek root. And, um, and it is defined in clinical medicine by having a low bone density. It is a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength and therefore increased fracture risk if someone should fall down. And bone strength is really reflective of bone density, and that's what you get in the clinical setting when you get your bone tested for uh, osteoporosis, as well as bone quality. You can see from these pictures evidence of normal bone, 
versus osteoporotic bone. And it doesn't take a lot of knowledge to see that if someone who has this kind of bone takes a fall, they're going to be far more likely to break a bone than someone who has bone that looks like this. The problem with osteoporosis is it's like high blood pressure or hypertension in that it's mainly a silent disease. That is until a fracture occurs. So our changes in bone strength over time cannot be seen outwardly. So you may not know that you even have it. It is a disease without warning signs. So that the first outward sign of osteoporosis could be a devastating hip or a spinal fracture. The picture depicts a hip fracture. So if that's the case, then how do you define it? If you haven't had a fracture, how do you know what your bone is, bone density is? Um, the number one clinical way right now of testing your bone density to see if you have osteoporosis is through a DEXA scan. And the World Health Organization got together experts from across the world to figure out what level of bone density should constitute the definition of osteoporosis. So they came up with a term called osteopenia, which sounds like a disease, but it is not a disease. It just means that one has low bone mass compared to someone, and actually it's now to a female age 30 in the same ethnic category. And that is um, measured by standard deviation, a statistical measurement to see how much below normal for a 30-year-old person is their bone density. So it would be between 1 and 2.5 standard deviations below peak bone mass. Osteoporosis is more severe than that, where someone is 2.5 standard deviations below peak bone mass. Then there's a category known as severe or established osteoporosis, where someone has a T-score or a BMD of less than 2.5 standard deviations below peak bone mass and one or more fragility fractures. So I wanted to put up this slide to show that while certainly DEXA bone density and the diagnosis of osteoporosis is predictive of having a fracture in the future, there are a lot of people, in fact, even more men who don't have necessarily osteoporosis by BMD, but they have osteopenia, low bone mass. And these people go on to fractures. So osteoporosis, certainly the lower your bone density is, the higher your risk of fracture. But even if you have low bone density, there are lots of people who still have a fracture. OK, so what is the concerned patient supposed to do? If you go onto the internet, which is exactly what I did, to f and Google images on osteoporosis, there's a lot of confusing information out there. I mean, what are you supposed to do? There's why taking osteoporosis drugs can be worse than t not taking anything. That's really encouraging. OK. Um, then there's the physicianscommittee.org on dairy, writing that for each glass of milk, your risk of dying from all causes increases by 15%. Come on, what is that? <laughs> How about the Wall Street Journal showing a new study indicates that patients are likely to suffer a rare thigh fracture the longer they take one of the so-called bisphosphonates drugs for bone-wasting disease osteoporosis. This looks really scary. Here, if you've taken less than two years of bisphosphonate, you're 35 times more likely to get exactly what you set out not to get. And then if you've taken it more than nine years, 176 times, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And then um, Blythe Danner, you know, then you've got the nice actress who's there promoting, oh, take this drug to prevent and just live a great life. Um, New England Journal became concerned because um, in the United States and one other country in the world is allowed to directly market to the consumer. All right? And no other countries, but here in the United States, we are allowed to turn on our TV and we watch endless drug commercials. And for $1 spent on advertising in the US, they make $4.20, all right? So it's effective. But then when you see that, you get suspicious. I mean, who do you trust? I mean, clearly, industry is interested in making a buck. They don't care about you as a person. So five popular osteoporosis drugs, are they safe? Or are they dangerous? What is one supposed to do? So 
thinking about the evidence. What is the evidence? So scientists like to think, oh, we're empirical. We look at the evidence objectively. We do quantitative statistics, and we come up with conclusions and guidelines of what to do. But the truth is, narrative communication is very effective. And this is what the mass media uses to get to us. Um, it's a norm. And it's intrinsically persuasive because it tells a story that a lot of us could relate to. So when you have narrative communication, which, by the way, is important, one might think and consider what the goals might be. For example, is it persuasion? Or could it be comprehension? For example, here is an FDA publication, Possible Fracture Risk with Osteoporosis Drugs. I believe if you read this narrative, it would be so that you could com comprehend what the risks might be and place them into context of whether these drugs are worth the risk versus the benefits. It turns out that in one of the highly regarded scientific journals, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2014, uh, a scientist went ahead and looked at how does mass media affect us in our scientific knowledge. Well, it serves as our primary source of information regarding science and health. And to be honest, I can't read everything on our science and climate change. I am as guilty as anyone else of getting on CNN or whatever it is to learn some of the latest science. 34% of the science is on TV or health information, 35% on the internet, 9% in magazines or print media, and about 3% from your doctors or colleagues who might know, okay? So we are all influenced by mass media. Well, what are you supposed to do? How do you interpret the data? What do you do even if experts do not agree? About 10 years ago, a Dr. Jerome Groupman, who is a writer for The New Yorker and a professor at Harvard, and his wife, Pamela, um, Patricia, I think, Hartsman, also at Harvard, um, came to talk about and had this concept of understanding your personal medical mind. Meaning, how do you, as an individual, weigh your individual risk and benefits in terms of health care? Are you a believer or are you a doubter? Are you a minimalist or a maximalist? Do you look for the latest technology or do you prefer natural healing? And in fact, both of them, when they spoke, Dr. Groupman said, well, I, you know, my father had an almost fatal heart attack and he was saved by the latest technology that they could offer at the time and now, you know, he enjoyed a very long life. So I'm really for the latest technology. And Dr. Hartsman said, well, my parents lived to be a very old age, and they were healthy, and the best thing they could do was stay away from doctors. So I prefer natural healing. So you can see within the same family and uh, 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 that you can have very differing views on, on how to, uh, what the medical mind might be. Um, I also want to take a point, uh, moment to talk about drug development. Going from the bench to bedside is a lengthy and very expensive process. On average, the time to develop an effective treatment in the form of a prescription drug takes somewhere between 10 and 15 years. And uh, believe it or not, although FDA often gets bad press, the process is rigorous. All right, so now let's talk all about osteoporosis and put it into perspective. It's true that in 2016, there are multiple effective drugs to treat osteoporosis. They have been shown in trial after randomized controlled trial to reduce the risk of vertebral fracture by 60 to 70 percent, hip fracture by 40 to 59 percent, and non-vertebral fracture by 20 to 35 percent. And in general, these drugs are pretty well tolerated. However, there are increasing concerns about the adverse side effects, long-term safety, the costs, and also profits and competing interests. So I found this cartoon years ago. It says, I stopped taking the medicine because I prefer the original disease to the side effects. So it's fortuitous that I was asked to give this lecture, and in between, while on vacation, I get this email about the front page of the New York Times, and I don't know how many of you may have seen it. 
But basically, the headline was essentially, fearing drugs, rare side effects. Millions take their chances with osteoporosis. So Gina Colada was the author, a scientific writer for the Times, and she um, probably used as a source an article by Ja A. All, who did a study showing that the internet spikes in activity between 2006 and 10 uh, occurred because of media reports of bisphosphonate use and osteonecrosis of the jaw. 2006, atrial fibrillation in 2008, and atypical femoral fractures in 2010. The results of those internet searches and that media, mass media publication rate um, showed that bisphosphonate use then declined by greater than 50% from 2008 to 2012. I guess it's no surprise. And another um, study recently just come out this year by Kim A. All. Um, showed that um, from using healthcare um, insurance data that among 22,598 patients followed uh, between 2004 to 2013, the bisphosphonate use declined from 15% to 3% probably based a lot on this mass media and figuring out what patients don't want to do, and sometimes then to do nothing, it might be better, because why would you want to get a fracture from a medicine that potentially could cause a fracture? And just to, uh, for comparison's sake, um, other drugs used to treat osteoporosis, the, those rates stayed the same, but they were also dismally low, like 5%. So it's not like a lot of people who have osteoporosis, even when they have a hip fracture, get hospitalized, get surgery, go to rehab, and then get home, get treated for their osteoporosis. So let's put this into the population perspective, okay? We know that our population is aging in general. And the projected growth in the United States is that with increased people living a long life, there's going to be increased low bone mass. Um, and these figures go from 2002 at 43.7 million up to 2020, we're not so far away from that, at 61.4 million. And it is also true, and this is from the US Office of the Surgeon General, that Osteoporotic fractures are costly and yet preventable. So fractures from osteoporosis numbered about 1.5 million. Hospitalizations, 500,000. Trips to the emergency room, which are no fun, 800,000. Visits to the doctor's office, maybe not fun, 2.6 million. And people placed into nursing homes, 180,000. So osteoporosis is a serious public health problem. 200 million people across the world are supposedly affected, 10 million of them Americans. And every year in the United States, um, there are 2 million fractures. And overall, women outnumber men, perhaps because they tend to live longer, but the male to fe female to male ratio is 1.6. If you look at the distributions of the types of fractures that people get, um, the most common is actually spine fracture at 27%. Wrist fracture, hip fracture, pelvis fracture, and all others are grouped together and make the other third. The truth is that 50% of osteoporosis-related repeat bone breaks in older adults can be prevented. This was not an option back in 1995. They had no FDA-approved medications, really, that were proven to show uh, this kind of decrease in fracture risk. All right, what about in comparison to other diseases. This is just one small slide showing that for a woman at the age of 50, you can, their one in two will be expected to have a fracture over a lifetime, as opposed to 12% for breast cancer. And for men, it's about one in five, and the um, expected incidence is greater than prostate cancer, which unfortunately is also common as we get older, if you're a man. And then vertebral fractures. These are actually the most common type of osteoporotic fracture with an estimated prevalence of 5% in men and 12.1% in women. And it's true that if you have a prior history of vertebral fracture, you're much more likely to have another fracture, either in your spine or somewhere else. The other kind of disconcerting thing about vertebral fractures is that only one third come to clinical attention. So two thirds of us are walking around and we don't even know that we have one. So some investigators in Canada 
thought besides bone density, what else could they do to help people screen and be aware whether they may not have a silent disease that they don't even realize they have yet? And they were able to show that if you've experienced, we all tend to lose height with age, but if you experience more than a two inch height loss, that could be something to maybe talk to your doctor about and consider if you haven't had a bone density, maybe you should get one, and should you have screening to see if you have an underlying vertebral fracture that you didn't know you have. Because if you do or do um, have a fracture, um, treatment is definitely potentially indicated. Here is a picture to, uh, showing what a typical vertebral fracture might look like. Most people, when you talk about fractures and not wanting osteoporosis, think about hip fractures for good reason because multiple epidemiologic studies over the years have shown in multiple populations across the world that your risk of dying in the next year is not insignificant. It's about 20%, with some studies going up beyond 30%. Some people have permanent disability because of the hip fracture at about 30%. Some are unable to walk independently anymore, some needing walkers or canes at 40%. And 80% have been reported to be unable to do at least one instrumental activity of daily living. That's what IADL means in geriatric speak. And by that, I mean something, uh, when you talk about instrumental activities, it's what you would need to do to be able to live independently, like get around to the store, get your own food, prepare your meals, things like that. All right, so fracture prevention, what can we do? I think it's good to think about who might be at risk for fracture, and there are just some things that we can't change, unfortunately. Um, we all are aging, and with increased age, bone mass goes down, and with bone mass going down, fracture risk goes up. Sex. Females tend to have lower peak bone mass than males, and then when we hit menopause, there is an acceleration of that bone loss, and women subsequently are at increased risk of fractures. Menopause, to my knowledge, we can't reverse that. Your ethnicity, also that's the genes that you get with your family history, you can't really change that. And if you've had a fracture, you've had a fracture. You can't really change that. But fortunately, there are things we can address and change. So the modifiable fracture risk factors that we have are diet, and I'll spend some time talking about that, health behaviors, for instance, smoking. None of you should be smoking at this point. Um, in the 70s, you were allowed, but in 2016, no. Sedentary behavior, what do we, I mean by that? I'll just say quickly, couch potato. People who sit down most of the day, they don't get up, they don't fidget in their chair, they just are comfortable sitting and for hours on end. Excessive alcohol, what is excessive? Actually, epidemiologic studies demonstrate that uh, people who drink alcohol actually enjoy a lot of good health. But a little, little bit is okay, too much is not good. And by too much, for women, they say usually not more than two drinks, alcoholic drinks in a, a day, and for men, greater than three. Then, uh, modifiable risk factor, vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency, most doctors now seem to be checking this anyway, because it's been linked to every, it's the newest hormone on the block, and it seems to be the cure-all. We'll wait and see about that. I'm not gonna spend much time talking about vitamin D, but for bones, if you're deficient, you should get vitamin D supplements. Bone mineral density, you get it tested by DEXA. This is something you could potentially improve. And then lastly, my favorite is balance. And I was happy to find this picture because this really depicts, like if we could all do this and not fall down, we'll be really good in terms of fracture prevention. What about diet? What should you be eating? Well, the Institute of Medicine just recently came out with their dietary guidelines from 2015 to 2020. They got together a bunch of experts from all across the country, uh, nutritionists, epidemiologists, physicians, a big panel of well-respected people, who then um, decided based on the evidence and reviewing of the literature, and this was a very um, extensive tax that they put forth, but they've decided that a variety of vegetables from all subgroups, so red, green, whatever, and fruits, especially whole fruits, grains, at least of which half are whole grains, fat-free or low-fat dairy, and a variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, 
legumes, nuts, and soy products, also oils. If you actually go to the website, which I will have up at the end of the lecture so you can see, they have really nice, beautiful diagrams of what you should be doing with a healthy eating pattern in terms of the healthy foods that I've just mentioned, and then also things that you should limit, such as saturated fats and trans fats, added sugars, and sodium. So they've developed this wonderful interactive website called choosemyplate.gov. And you can click on there and learn all about diet. And the nice thing about it is it's not that there's just one diet that we should be eating. The one that I just described was um, designed for Americans and covers an, um, an average American diet. But they also have guidelines for people who prefer a Mediterranean diet, for example. Or what if you're vegetarian? What do you do? They have specific guidelines for vegetarians as well. And all of these different types of eating patterns can be healthy. The other thing is before, I don't know if many of you have been familiar with this food pyramid, but I could never figure out what a serving was. They say, oh, you need five servings of vegetables a day. What does that mean? So they also have nice guidelines of, OK, well, a half portion of green beans is equal to a half cup equivalent of a vegetable. Um, a half cup of cooked brown rice equals equal to one ounce of equivalent grains. So they, this website is really nice, and I think the artist did a very nice job because I guess I like color, but it really works out well. All right, I'm going to spend the next few t slides talking about calcium because, as I said before, I see patients who come to see me for osteoporosis. That's all I basically do clinically now. And most of them who come say, well, I'm taking my calcium, my doctor took, you know, and I take this calcium, I go to Costco or whatever. And it's true that calcium supplementation is still widely recommended in the United States, though truthfully, the data are controversial. Right now, the FDA recommends that older men and women take in 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams per day for bone health and fracture prevention. You go to the National Osteoporosis Foundation website, you're going to find it. The average daily intake in Western countries has been published in studies when they try to estimate what people are actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis when they eat is between seven and 900 milligrams a day, which suggests that maybe we're not getting enough, such that 30 to 50 percent of older women are taking calcium supplements. And if they come to my osteoporosis clinic, it seems like almost 90 percent are taking calcium of one type or another. So Dr. Boland from New Zealand uh, published in the British Medical Journal, which is another highly regarded medical journal. Um, well, let's look at the data. There have been a lot of randomized controlled trials of calcium supplementation. And what, what is the evidence to suggest that this is going to actually prevent you from fracturing? Well, his pooled analysis reported an 11 percent total fracture risk reduction with 14 percent reduction in vertebral fractures, but no effect on hip fractures, no effect on arm fractures. And if you took the largest study done that had the lowest risk of bias, um, there was no effect of calcium supplements on any, um, any fracture. So this suggests that, and this is what they wrote in their uh, discussion, that widespread and targeted use of calcium supplements in older individuals is unlikely to result in meaningful reductions in the incidence of fracture. OK, so I admit in my clinic, I, I say that, and anybody who's come to see me, I usually tell them to cut down the calcium. But I said, oh, but you can th think about diet, and here are calcium-rich foods. Well, um, I'll say, I'll start with a lower point first, that there have only been two randomized controlled trials of dietary sources of calcium that in included 262 people total and found no benefit in fracture risk um, reduction for those who got the uh, dietary supplementation. And in addition to this, Dr. Boland came out in about 2008 with another uh, big splash saying, oh, guess what? If you, women who um, were randomized to receive calcium versus placebo were more likely to get heart attacks, uh, more likely to get kidney stones, and there were hospitalizations for acute gastrointestinal symptoms. So it's possible that this calcium supplementation stuff can be actually causing harm. So just in the past few months, 
uh, Dr. Fang um, published in the leading bone mineral research journal, a journal of bone and mineral research to be specific, um, that he looked at six, or she, 6,210 people who were living in China and filled out the China Health and Nutrition Survey. And these people followed mainly a plant-based diet. In China, there's not a lot of dairy, OK? And um, he then quoted the Singapore Chinese Health Study that included 63,000 men and women, and the Swedish mammography cohort that included almost 62,000 women, and um, saw that actually there could be possible harm associated with taking a lot of calcium in the diet. Get that. So here is the graph from this most recent publication showing that in men who had very low intake of calcium, less than 275 milligrams, were at a much higher risk of having a hip fracture. Or at, this is any uh, first fracture risk, it says. And then if they had more than 70, 780 milligrams a day, there is also an increase in risk here. Similarly, the same trend with women. This is what we call a U-shaped curve. If you get too little, you're at increased risk. If you get too much, you're at increased risk. So uh, this is just something to give pause for thought. And then, just yesterday, as I was finishing this talk, I get this online journal, Osteoporosis International. So what is the statistical evidence? Guess what? The experts don't agree. <laughs> I happen to know Dr. Weaver and Dr. Bess Dawson Hughes um, and uh, Dr. LaBeouf. They come out in early or this year and they say, well, we're going to do an updated ana meta analysis, which means they pull all the studies that are out there to say, does calcium plus vitamin D prevent the fracture? And they kind of conclude, yeah, you should be taking your calcium and vitamin D. Well, guess what? The same guy, Dr. Boland and Dr. Reed, who are also very well uh, respected experts in bone health from New Zealand, said, guess what? You've got some errors in your tables. The numbers don't match the text. I think you, you know, I'm a little concerned specifically because, and they wrote this in their introduction in their letter, the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and uh, Wong, I think, is from there, uh, depends on sponsorship from a range of commercial entities, many with vested interests in calcium and vitamin D. Two commercial sponsors of the NAF meta-analysis, the Council for Responsible Nutrition, or CRN, and the Natural Products Association regularly denigrate clinical research findings that show no benefit or harm from supplements. So Dr. Weaver and Dr. Hughes being responsible, and this guy from NAF and Joanne Lappy, they get together and they say, I think she's from Canada, say, oh, guess what? You're right. There were a few errors. But we went back and we fixed those number uh, discrepancies. We re-performed the analysis. And guess what? We still have a benefit from taking calcium and D in terms of fracture risk reduction. So we do not change the conclusions of what we said of the original meta-analysis. And if anything, results got stronger. And by the way, according to the Institute of Medicine guidelines, all of our data are transparent. You can get them at your will and re-look at the data. Well, Osteoporosis International, being probably the second most widely cited journal in the osteoporosis field, decided the editors, well, let's get a third party involved. So they got my friend Dr. Wynn from Sydney, Australia, the Garvin Institute, who loves statistics, got the data, reanalyzed the data, and also concurred that there's uncertain effects of calcium and D supplementation on fracture risk reduction. He did a Bayesian analysis for any of those of you who are statistically minded. So I think the jury's out. And in terms of what you should do with calcium and supplementation, right now, the benefits seem very questionable, and harm is also a possibility. So why pay and go to Costco and take pills that could make you constipated? <laughs> Physical activity. All right, so I had to go back to 2008 to get the US Department of Health and Human Services updated guidelines um, on what you should do. But I thought it was interesting, because I actually read them this time. So I put them up here for you. And this is actually for only people ages 18 to 64. They have different guidelines for people over the age of 65, but I'll summarize those quickly. 
They think that you should get two hours and 30 minutes a week of moderate intensity, which means brisk walking, dancing, swimming, biking on a level terrain, any of those. Or one hour and 15 minutes a week of vigorous intensive aerobic activity, which is jogging, single tennis, swimming laps, and bicycling uphill. And then finally, um, the aerobic activity should be performed in episodes of at least 10 minutes, and preferably it should be spread throughout the week, and that one should focus on muscle strengthening that involve all the major muscle groups on two or more days a week. Well, what about the benefits in terms of exercise and osteoporosis? One thing we can think about is if you are physically fit, you probably have a decreased risk of falling, and fall prevention is very key in terms of preventing the fracture. You probably have improved bone mass and strength, although these studies have been less exciting than uh, to report those results. Um, improve your muscle, you improve your balance and flexibility and posture, improve cardiovascular fitness, and your mood probably could get better too. And as I said, fall prevention is at least as important as fracture prevention. And it's true that many falls can be prevented by making some cha changes. And four things that one could do to prevent falls is one, exercise to improve your balance and strength. Two, have your healthcare provider review your medicines. Because oftentimes, if, especially if you live in an urban area, you see more than one practitioner and you get placed on so many drugs that it's hard to keep track of them all. The average older person is probably taking at least four to five drugs. Have your vision checked and do a home safety check because safe environments lead to le less falls. And this is um, actually a CDC provided document that um, resulted from an effort um, called STEADY, which stands for Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. This is their website. And they, I took these pictures in the website. Um, they're actually randomized controlled trials that show that if you perform Tai Chi regularly, you're less likely to fall than if you don't. And I pulled this from their um, brochure because this is what I do with my patients in clinic. We all see if we can do the chair stand. And it's really a good sign if you can get up from a chair without using your arms. And if you can't get up from a chair without using your arms, that's a good goal in terms of physical activity. Moving on to drug treatments. Bisphosphonates, as I said, are still the number one treatment for osteoporosis probably in the world. The mechanism of action is that it inhibits the bone resorbing cells by attaching to these binding sites and the bone that interfere with osteoclastic or bone resorbing activity. And the most common, pr commonly prescribed bisphosphonates include alendronate, known as Fosamax, resigenate, actinol, or, and it's known as Atilvia II, abandronate, or Beneva, zolandronic acid, which is the IV form given once a year, known as Reclast. And this is just a cartoon to show the osteoclast getting blocked by the bisphosphonates. So what is the clinical benefit of bisphosphonates? Um, there is definitely a relative risk reduction for fractures in postmenopausal women. So after three years of treatment, there is a, um, a definite decrease in uh, risk in, in all four of them, um, with zolandronic acid having the biggest effect. Most of us do worry about the hip fracture, and this is why I personally don't prescribe the Neva, because it was never shown to prevent the hip fracture, but all the other bisphosphonates uh, significantly reduce the risk of hip fracture. So um, all the trials together, these are different drugs, different companies, decrease the risk of spine, hip, and wrist fractures by about 36 to 70%. And um, there's some evidence that there could be some other side benefits in terms of survival in breast cancer and other cancer patients. I have a colleague in Duke who, through the reclass trial, there was actually decreased mortality. So there's thoughts that there could have other benefits in terms of cardiac survival in these people. And there are multiple dosing regimens available. Generally, prefer to use the mouth if you can. So there are three oral medications. There's also subcutaneous medication, as well as the IV uh, medication. OK, the risks. 
Well, they're out there. The first one is GI side effects, and they've done this since before the drug was FDA approved. That's why if you take the drug on the, in the oral way, you have to sit up and, and for half an hour take a pill on an empty stomach with a full glass of water, because otherwise it, effect, it very much irritates the stomach. Musculoskeletal pains are also not uncommonly um, talked about or described by patients, maybe, I don't know, 10%. Then there's the acute phase responses, which is really just a flu-like symptoms that pe some patients get within 24 to 48 hours of getting the IV formulation. And esophageal cancer has been reported in the literature, but these are through what we call case control studies, where they get people who get the disease, and they compare them to age match controls, and then they ask them all these questions. And generally, if you get something, you remember a lot more about your past than if you don't get something. So that's why those t uh, um, studies are um, often report more strong findings and actually are, are confirmed in larger, larger and longitudinal studies. There's also eye pain that has been rarely reported. Um, osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is what um, has been reported in some patients when they get dental work, their tooth gets pulled, and then the jaw doesn't heal, and it can be um, pretty messy to get healed. But they do heal. It's just not a fun side effect. Atrial fibrillation, which is a irregular heartbeat, that was reported in the randomized controlled trial of the IV form of the medication. And then lastly, the one that's really not good for, for people who are thinking about trying to prevent the fracture is, you know what, if I take this medicine, I could actually get a fracture. That's not good, but it's a very uncommon event, very, very uncommon compared to the risk of actually getting a fracture. So let's go through some of those data. So this is kind of like what a classic femoral insufficiency fracture would look like. Um, there are two case series where, you know, orthopedic surgeons noticed that these were happening and talked to the patients, and they're often preceded by some thigh pain. Um, you don't even have to fall down necessarily to get this fracture. You could just be walking, for example, stepping out of the shower. And it's clear that long-term use of bisphosphonates is associated with getting this kind of fracture. So being concerned, some of my colleagues who've been involved with these large randomized controlled trials went back to look and look at the hip fractures that occurred within the trial. So you know, over 6,000 uh, women, for example. And they found that there was no significant difference in these types of fractures. There weren't very many types of these fractures, but there were about three in the uh, control group and four in the treatment group. So clearly, they also happen people who've never been on any osteoporosis medications. Then Denmark, which has a great patient registry, um, showed that only 7% were bisphosphonate users, which was the same percentage among those with typical hip fractures, and that the distribution between the typical and atypical hip fractures were in identical between people who were taking alendronate and those people who were not. So there was no significant difference saying that, you know what, if you have osteoporosis, you're more likely to fracture, and you're also more likely to be on a medication, and you can't say that it's the medication itself. But then um, people from Canada also have great, uh, there's a lot of people interested in osteoporosis up there. So they, they did a large population-based nested case control study of women over the age of 68. And they found 716 women with subtrunk or femoral shaft fractures and matched them up to up to five controls. And they found that compared with just a, a transient use of these bisphosphonates, treatment for greater than five years was definitely associated with an increased risk of these atypical fractures that you see right here, with an odds ratio of 2.7, which was significant. But also, these same people had a decreased risk of overall osteoporotic fracture with a 24% decreased risk that was also statistically significant. And they concluded in their paper that the absolute risk for an atypical insufficiency fracture is very low, somewhere, you know, just a few, a handful in hundreds of thousands of people as opposed to a one in two risk of fracture in um, just a regular aging old woman. Then Dr. Dell from Kaiser Permanente, who's an orthopedic surgeon, um, was also very good at computer skills. So he um, looked at over 1.8 million people um, age 45 and older. And if you're a Kaiser member, they're very good 
partially because of Dr. Dell in making sure that you get your bone density and you get treated with a bisphosphonate. So there are a lot of people on the Kaiser members who have been on bisphosphonates. And he looked at the duration of bisphosphonate use between 1996 and 2011. And over a five-year period, um, he found 11,466 with ephemeral fracture and 142 atypical stress-type fractures. And if you've ever met Rick Dell, he actually personally looked at all of these at 4.45, all the films that came in, 4.45 in the morning on Saturday in his free time to make sure to classify what kind of fractures these were. And this is probably where Wall Street Journal got the data showing that with more use of bisphosphonates in terms of years, the age-adjusted incidence of having an atypical fracture went dramatically up. And if you look at that paper that was published, um, 49.3% were Asian, thin female Asians. And certainly 49% Asian does not make up the entire Kaiser population. So there's something about Asian females and risk of these types of fractures that is um, unusual. So what is a patient to do? How long, if you decide to take a bisphosphonate, should this treatment be given? Well, it's true that these bisphosphonate-type drugs have long residence time in bone, and that maybe we really need to reconsider how long people should be treated. So going back to the trial data from all those wonderful people who agreed to be studied, um, they did a five-year extension of the fracture intervention trial, which was the original Fosamax trial. And um, uh, they then asked patients who had been given the drug whether they'd be willing to be re-randomized and followed for an additional five years, 10 years total, to continue the drug versus uh, being willing to possibly get the placebo. And uh, fortunately, over 1,000 were. And what they found was that the clinical vertebral fractures were reduced by 55%. And in those who had very low bone density, meaning greater, less than 2.5 standard deviations below the mean, or T-scores of negative 2.5, were um, they also enjoyed a risk reduction in non-vertebral fractures. Here's a slide from that paper. That one thing nice is that, um, and I like to tell patients this because a lot of times people come to me already having been treated, that if you've taken it, you still enjoy a benefit in terms of your bone density. It's not like it just goes back down to where you started. And, um, and if you took the drug and then you got randomized to placebo, so you really didn't have to take it for the next five years, there was no difference. These lines are exactly overlapping in terms of non-vertebral fractures. It was only in the clinical vertebral fractures that they saw a significant difference. So the key findings are that there is overall no difference in non-spine fractures between the two groups. And after um, five years of therapy, and people who didn't took the placebo had a benefit. They had still a pretty good bone density. And so discontinuation after five years for up to more uh, five more years does not significantly increase fracture risk. I think that's what that, that study is telling us. Also. Um, experts conclude that five to 10 years appears to be safe for most people. But if you're an Asian thin female, you might consider having the dose. And in fact, in Hong Kong and Taiwan, that's exactly what doctors are telling their patients to do, and consider a shorter treatment of uh, three years. So um, for patients, really assessing the fracture risk on an ongoing basis. And if they're determined to be a lower risk for fracture, really think about that drug holiday after beginning, say, three years, three to five years. But if they're, if they're at higher risk of fracture, suggesting like that they're on steroids and they have, to be, they have rheumatoid arthritis, then you might think about a drug holiday much later, or even if at all. The next treatment is denosumab, known as prolia. And this has been FDA approved since 2010. It's nice because it works by a different mechanism of action. It's a monoclonal antibody, and it works as an anti-resorptive or preventing bone loss. It, it binds to the rank ligand receptor, which actually activates the osteoclast, which again, depicted here, is the bone resorbing cell. And it's, uh, it's given not as a pill, but as a twice yearly subcutaneous injection, and has been well tolerated. So from the New England Journal and the Freedom Trial of 7,800 women um, ages 60 to 90 who had a, a osteoporosis with, and about a fifth of them had uh, vertebral fractures or even a quarter, 
you see that they enjoyed a 68% risk reduction of having any additional vertebral fractures, a 20% reduction in um, any non-vertebral fracture, and a 40% reduction in incident hip fracture. So denosumab worked and it got FDA approved. It prevents the hip, non-spine, and vertebral fractures. It prevents bone loss in postmenopausal women with breast cancer who have to take aromatase inhibitors. It also prevents skeletal adverse effects in women with breast cancer and metastatic bone disease. And it's also been studied in men uh, with prostate cancer, which also, if it gets serious, can go to the bone. But with any drugs, including aspirin, there are risks. So one of those risks is osteonecrosis of the jaw. The incidence is reported to be about one in 1,000 cancer patients who get much higher doses of denosumab. In the cancer world, it's known as Exgeva. And instead of 60 milligrams twice a year, it's given at 120 milligrams once a month. Skin infections were also reported in the randomized controlled trial, where uh, people would get and report skin infections uh, that would not necessarily be at the site of injection, but they were rare, but significantly greater than the people who received the placebo injection. And there's a thought that because the rank ligand receptor is on uh, lymphocytes, which are the immune fighting cells, that perhaps there is an, an increased risk of infection. Hypocalcemia, or low serum calcium, has also been reported, particularly in patients who have chronic kidney disease. So this is something that gets checked by a doctor who might be prescribing this medicine to make sure that hypocalcemia does not become a problem. And then finally, atypical femoral fractures, yet again, are, have been reported, not many, but there are a few that have been reported in uh, patients who have received this medication. Moving on to Forteo, known as teriparatide. It's a recombinant human parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is the hormone that regulates the calcium in our blood. And its mechanism of action is also different from the previous drugs that I've been talking about. It's called an anabolic drug, meaning that it actually builds bone. It's the only one. But unfortunately, it tends to be expensive, and you have to keep it in the fridge and give yourself a daily injection, which is, can be cumbersome for some people. The other thing is it's limited to only two years of treatment. And one thing about this medication is once you stop it, all those gains in building bone, you will eventually see lost and not an insignificant um, period of time. So it's not something that stays around forever. Some of the smart medical students will ask, well, I don't get it. We know that if you have increased parathyroid hormone circulating in your system, it's bad for your bone, and people get, the, you know, this is called a disease entity that needs surgical correction. So why is it that you give parathyroid hormone and your bone gets better? And the idea is the intermittent uh, administration of the PTH actually helps build bone, as opposed to a sustained increased um, elevation of the parathyroid hormone. So the benefits, again, are that it's anabolic, so it helps build the bone. There are some animal rat models that suggest that there is a dramatic improvement in skeletal repair. Um, in fact, a human study in people who have uh, distal radius or wrist fractures improved in those who received the 20 milligram microgram versus placebo dose, but not among those who received the higher dose. And there are uh, ongoing clinical trials attempted to see if, if you have, say, an atypical femoral fracture, should you be given this medicine? Um, and uh, see if that helps facilitate treatment. Um, so uh, these, are, these are questions that remain to be answered. Uh, but I did talk to a colleague who, uh, across the country who says even in the sports world now, they're, they're using this to get their athletes back on the, uh, on the field because they really believe it helps. And if you talk to orthopedic surgeons, they sometimes will ask you to go, go see your endocrinologist to see if you can be on this medicine. But, I'm telling you the data are not uh, ready yet to know for sure. So what are the risks? Well, the safety and efficacy is really not known past two years. And the reason why the FDA, when it approved the drug back in the early 2000s, said, we're only going to give you this approval for two years of use. And that was because they gave rats 30 times the dose, and uh, a proportion of those rats developed osteosarcoma, which is something you definitely don't want. Um, and so nobody gives it uh, more than two years. There are some common side effects, nausea, hot headache, and dizziness, but often those tend to be transient. 
Moving on, this is only for the women in the room. Men, you're excluded. There is also Evista, Riloxifene, which has been on the market for many years now, probably 20 plus. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's not a hormone, but it binds to the estrogen receptors differently than does estrogen, and it has estrogen-like effects as well as some anti-estrogen activity. So the nice thing about Veloxifene is that it reduces bone turnover to the normal premenopausal range, so you can't reverse menopause, but you can help your bones. Um, it allows adequate repair of micro damage and moderate increase in mineralization, and it preserves the heteros heterogeneous mineral distribution so that people can be on this drug for a long time. There are no long-term side effects associated with being on this drug in terms of uh, atypical femoral fractures, for example. And it, you might ask, well, gosh, if this is so great, then why, aren't, why isn't this number one? Well, first of all, it can't be used in men. Second of all, um, it was shown in its randomized control trial of over 6,000 women that it did reduce the risk of having an incident vertebral fracture, but it didn't show a reduction in any of the other types of fractures about which many of us are concerned. But interestingly enough, when those results came out, the women who received the drug instead of the placebo had an 80% decreased risk of incident breast cancer. And also, mortality was less in some of those randomized controlled trials. The results were so interesting and in, um, intriguing that they got published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and they went ahead and did another randomized control trial uh, comparing um, women who were at high risk of breast cancer to tamoxifen versus raloxifene, and showed that actually uh, raloxifene works very well in terms of breast cancer prevention and women at risk for breast cancer. But again, side effects. Unlike estrogen replace, or hormone replacement therapy that helps you with your hot flashes, they'll cause hot flashes in some women, which can be very bothersome. They can be associated with increased risk of leg cramps, and then most bothersome is this risk of blood clots. And the risk is similar to that of seen with estrogen replacement therapy. In the 1980s, 90s, many postmenopausal women were taking estrogen, and we didn't think about the blood clot risk, but it's the same. About 1.8 per 1,000 women years, so you'd need to treat about 170 women to get one blood clot risk. So. To summarize the drugs that currently are FDA approved right now, um, the ones in the light blue show evidence of vertebral fracture, non-vertebral fracture, and hip fracture risk reduction with teriparatide, the Forteo one, not showing hip fracture benefit, but being the one anabolic therapy. So all of these have been used. Um, I didn't talk about calcitonin, but there are concerns about safety, and the efficacy is very questionable. So. Um, I don't prescribe that for my patients. In terms of emerging uh, treatments, there's a baloperatide, and um, it is under FDA approval. Uh, I'm a uh, process, but it's not FDA approved. It's a PTHRP-like molecule. Here, uh, the design was for 18 months, uh, comparing against placebo, abaloperatide, subcutaneously versus teriparatide, and showing a benefit in terms of new vertebral fractures with a relative risk reduction of 86%. And um, teriparatide also showed a benefit, so that's encouraging if anybody doubted the initial trial data. And for non-vertebral fracture, similar types of risk reductions, though not quite as strong, by 43%. And because of these data, um, they are now undergoing FDA approval process. and. Um, these active extend trials, what they did is they gave the patients the drug for 18 months, but then switched them to alendronate, which is Fosamax, and continued to follow them and, and show continued benefit in terms of fracture risk reduction. Finally, I'm going to end with the latest um, emerging medicine, um, and it gives an example of going from the bench to the bedside with sclerostosis and Van Buchen's disease, where um, people who are affected by this disease have very strong bones, and they don't fracture. And scientists were able to determine that this was due to the absence of a sclerostin, an inhibitor of a Wnt signaling pathway that's important in uh, cellular signaling. But people who carry one copy of this gene were noticed to have higher bone density uh, with um, intermediate levels of sclerostin.
And so they started to try to get an antibody against sclerostin to see if maybe it could be used in people with osteoporosis. They went through their phase one trial, and then with positive results that it seemed safe, they then uh, started a phase two trial that included 419 women at 28 study centers who were aged 55 to 85 with low T scores between negative two and negative 3.5. And they got varying doses. It's also a subcutaneous medicine given either monthly or um, every three months. And their primary outcome was a change in bone density at the spine. This was published in the New England Journal in 2014. And one thing you hope if you do a randomized controlled trial is that they get randomized to these different groups. And uh, you hope that they look the same. And they did. In fact, in terms of age, they were about on, on age 67. Their bone densities were very equivalent. Their bone markers of turnover were also equivalent, so no differences. And these were the remarkable results. So from 0 to 12 months, lumbar spine bone density increased in those who received the romazozumab by 11.3%. That's a lot. And um, the alendronate is here, so it also did better in, than placebo, as did the teriparatide or the forteo. They also looked at hip and femoral neck, which is not your neck, but that's the part of the hip that breaks if, uh, if you fall down. And uh, there were also significant increases in uh, by about 3.7 to 4.1 percent. So based on the phase two results, they were then allowed to go to phase three. And uh, they have several different studies going of different designs, but this one just got um, published uh, to the public on February 21st, showing that, yes, they look like it's looking very promising that if for fracture outcomes, there is an apparent reduction in the incidence of new vertebral fractures at months 20 and 24. And likewise, there was a reduction in clinical fractures, which means vertebral as well as non-vertebral fractures at 12 months, but they did not show a benefit at 24 months. This medication is only going to be intended for use for one year. So these people then got followed up with uh, treatment of denosumab uh, or prolia, because the idea is that if you don't follow up with an anti-resorptive, you might lose the benefits that you put in for getting those shots for one year. So to finish up as a geriatrician, because that's what I trained to do when I went to medical school. Basically, osteoporosis is a very common condition. It affects many older people. And like many diseases that affect um, the population, it has effective treatments available, and as well as practice guidelines who should be treated and diagnosed, et cetera. But most prescription drugs that are out there target only a single condition. And the truth is, is that as we get older, the percent of us that are affected by more than two health chronic conditions, chronic health conditions, um, increase. So by the time you're 65, between 65 and 79, studies have shown that over a third have at least two chronic health conditions. And by the time, if you're lucky enough to make it to 80 and over, 70.2 percent have more than two chronic health conditions. So by definition, when you're thinking about health care and an older person, there definitely may be some competing priorities. The other thing that is evident is that the way in which we, as people, age um, is very variable. There's chronological age, which is time on the clock, as well as physiologic or biologic age, which is kind of how our, our body ages over time. And these differences become more and more pronounced as we get older. And I found this picture on the internet. These women, one is 74, the other is 74, but they look very, very different. So if we're in that group that is faced with multiple comorbidities or multiple illnesses and chronic health conditions, um, then there are not so many guidelines that help clinicians optimize care. I mean, the studies that looked at all these drugs, you had to be generally healthy uh, to be included in the trials. So what is someone who's faced with getting older and having multiple conditions supposed to do? Well, it's important to really understand that each of us has our own individual ideas and goals and priorities in life. And that while, especially in urban practice, academic medical centers, we have a lot of different doctors for our eyes and for our heart and for our bones, that medical care really should be coordinated. 
and sometimes to consider the fact that less is more. The Institute of Medicine has also come out with this idea of uh, concept of time to benefit, TTB. And the idea is to really think about healthcare treatment and priorities in context so that one ultimately chooses treatment plans that emphasize the benefit, reduce the harm, and increase the quality of life. Now that seems really like a no-brainer, but sometimes when you get so stuck on a particular disease or condition and you just want to be bullseye or right onto that thing, it may not be the best idea. It's really good to put things into context. So, we really have to balance the benefits against the risks. And I'm going to encourage all of us to go back to that consideration of the medical mind, really questioning where your medical mind is, what are the experiences throughout your life that have caused you to you know, make the choices that you make in terms of your health care. And interestingly, I went back to review what Jerome Groupman might have thought about this idea of medical mind. And I was I noticed that in 2011, when I found the New York Times article on his book that just came out, uh, he actually changed his um, view. So when I heard him speak live. He said, I'm for the latest and greatest uh, things that can be out there in terms of technology. But then I think somewhere in between, he might have had a back surgery or something. So then he said, you know, I used to be much more, but now I'm less. So uh, these things can change. Your ideas can change. And that's OK, right? Um, certainly, though, what I can say in 2016, there are some benefits that are just not in question. And maybe you could even ask, why do you need scientific studies to tell you this? Because it should be a no-brainer. Eating healthy is really, really important. And to think about what you put in your mouth almost as if it's medicine. Is it good for you or is it not good for you? Now, there's certain joys in life. People come to me in clinic and say, well, I, I, uh, I used the coffee mate in my coffee. Is that OK? Or I drank soda. I know that's not so good. And it's really, you know, I've even had 85-year-olds say, I'm a smoker. You know, do I really need to stop smoking? These are things, you know, you know, but just be conscious about what you're doing because they have health consequences. Um, regular physical activity. So even if you're not that mobile, even sitting in a chair, you can do exercises and be aware of your muscles and your core tone. And um, I, I'm definitely not into smoking. So smoking, no. But uh, you got to, I'm not. I'm not in my patients' bodies. If that's what gives them joy in life and they've made it to 85, I'm not going to argue. So what is clear is benefits of FDA approved valfius process medications um, generally outweigh the harms, particularly those who are at high fracture risk. For example, those who've had multiple fractures um, up until then, these people definitely have a propensity of fractures, and there are ways to prevent them by using medications. If you've got really, really low bone density and you're very thin, certainly that's another thing to consider. And finally, if you have an unsteady gait and you're at risk for falling, um, you should work on that. But sometimes it falls can't be prevented. Being on an osteo medication, paralysis medication can certainly help prevent the fracture should you fall. So with that, I'm going to close this lecture. And I do have some time left over for questions, if there are any. Um, before I move, I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is just going to put some of those resources, if you want to jot them down, in terms of dietary headlines, uh, diet guidelines, physical activity guidelines, and the CDC fall prevention measures. OK, I saw a hand uh, in the very back. So the question was, I was told by my physician to take Super K, K complex for bones. Have you ever heard of that? So my answer is that um, in terms of that particular formulation, Super K, um, no. I can't say that I have, but I am aware that there are vitamin K preparations out there. And there's ideas that that vitamin K um, interacts with the, the cathepsin uh, pathway for bone remodeling. So there is some scientific rationale behind that recommendation. But there's nowhere close to FDA recommendations that you're going to actually prevent the fracture. Uh, so I would say that the evidence is out. We don't know.
So the question is, is prolia safer than the other bisphosphonates in terms of osteoporosis, I'm sorry, osteonecrosis of the jaw? So the answer to that question is actually, uh, I had the honor of speaking for the American Academy of Oral Medicine and the ADA about a year ago and met with the dentists and oral surgeons who are faced with treating this problem. And I would say the consensus was that to prevent this, really a lot of them think that there's been pre-existing uh, dental disease, periodontal disease that was there prior to even starting the drugs and the drugs just potentiate it. Um, to differentiate between the bisphosphonate mechanism and the uh, prolia me mechanism can't say that one risk is better than the other. But mainly, if you get preventive care, that's a, a big part of it. And um, also, uh, the dosing matters uh, for prolia. So it was really those people who were having cancer and getting the uh, monthly injections that had the much greater risk at one in 1,000. Otherwise, the risk for both, any of these um, anti-resorpses is somewhere between 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000 people. So it's very, very rare. The question was whether uh, you see a chiropractor, you have um, osteopenia as well as poor balance, and he's recommending some neck readjustments. Is that correct? Um, so unfortunately, chiropractors and Western physicians don't interact that much, um, but uh, clearly they have a, uh, a place in helping people feel better. Uh, I'm not clear how neck manipulation would help with um, your osteopenia, per se. With balance, that's a different um, question, and I am uh, unaware of any studies that have, um, there's certainly postural uh, adjustments that can be made that, and, and working on core strengthening and balance that help, but not for the osteopenia, per se. So the question was, how does osteoarthritis, which is the inflammation of joints, affect the bone density test and reliability of what your bone density really is? In the spine, which is one of the main areas that gets tested when you go for a DEXA scan to test for osteoporosis, it is a big problem. So uh, in general, you cannot rely, if you have a lot of osteoporosis, arthritis changes in your spine, you cannot really be sure of what your spinal bone density is. The hip tends to be less of a problem. So the question is, now that some of these drugs have been on the market long enough, they're no longer made by US manufacturers, and how do drugs in India compare, and what are the quality standards? This is not a literature that I personally have reviewed lately, but the general feeling is that generics are acceptable, and the FDA is pretty regulated. Even, I think, in foreign-produced drugs, they have to pass certain standards. But um, you can't directly quote me on that, because I have not done the personal journey through the Fosamax and Lendronate story. But uh, I think overall, with the exception of a few medications, the generic forms of all the medications that we take, I don't question it when I get an infection and I get the generic form of an antibiotic, and generally it works. So I'm more concerned about supplements not being FDA re regulated so that when you go out and buy your salpametal for whatever reason, you're actually not getting salpametal, you're getting something else. The question is that um, this uh, nice lady went to her doctor who prescribed Beniva. Uh, there, are, there is evidence that it works. I personally do not prescribe it as a practitioner just because I like to see the evidence in the drug that showed that it prevents hip fractures. And I question if I'm taking the drug, I want to prevent the hip fracture. So if there are other sources av available, I don't know why I would choose it. But that's an individual decision. Well, I think, you know, apart from this lady being concerned about Indian manufacturing of Alendronate, Alendronate is still um, very well studied, and, and um, that would be fine. Well, that's a really good question. And um, either of those physicians are, are making uh, reasonable choices, and uh, it becomes very personal at that point. I um, So the question was that the person is taking a Remedex, which we know will cause bone loss, and what medication should she take? And two different physicians have given her two different answers. Um, and that's not uncommon, um, not just in osteoporosis world, but in other worlds as well, in terms of medicine. So I had it, oh, so the question was, 
what if I just do exercise, forget all the medicines, will I get stronger bones? And um, I actually have that on the slide, but I'd love to see that um, actually referenced with a study that would show that definitively. So I was very general in my recommendations in terms of diet and exercise, but I think what we can say is people who go into space lose their bone very rapidly. That's been shown. If you get hospitalized and you're on your back for a month or more, you lose bone. So it just makes sense that exercise is a good thing for bone. And um, yes, I think that you would have to go on that faith to believe that if you're doing the right things for your body, not only will you improve your bone, you improve your function and a lot of other cellular changes with aging. So, I think I planted you in the audience. The question was, how long is it safe to be on Prolia? Well, um, the Freedom Trial, which came out in the New England Journal about 2009, have been following those same patients now for 10 years. And the, at the last bone meeting last fall in, um, Oh, I forgot where it was. But anyway, they, they discussed those long-term data at 10 years. And what you see are continued increases in bone density as well as fracture prevention. So of course, that's Amgen speaking that it, it seems like it's a long-term uh, benefit. But um, yes, there that's encouraging data. But again, there is the atypical femoral fracture risk um, that has been reported in that medication. So. Um, uh, so uh, your question, or you're asking me about prolia and the shot, and if you get the dose in that is given when you go and get that medication from your doctor, is uh, is your risk for a fracture less or more? Is that your question? Okay, so that slide um, just represented the doses that are used, but there's only one dose that's used for osteoporosis, and that's 60 milligrams twice a year. The other dosage is used for patients who um, are, are cancer survivor, you know, survivors and needing treatment to prevent uh, skeletal metastases. So the question is, with a 60 milligram dose twice a year, do we still see atypical femoral fractures? Um, the answer is, uh, we have seen a few, not many. Uh, so it's there, but it's again much smaller than the risk reduction from getting a typical hip fracture. I'd have to go back to those slides to see, but you, you do start seeing an effect within, I, th I haven't looked at the curves exactly to tell you exactly what time, so I do not know the question, um, the answer at this point in terms of how long it takes to see an effect, but bone density, you do see an effect pretty quickly. Um, the question was how long do you expect to see an effect when you get treated with prolia? Yes. Basically, the question is that what about raloxifene since it's been shown in randomized controlled trials to prevent breast cancer in patients at high risk? What about patients who already have breast cancer? And unfortunately, there were studies to look at patients who had breast cancer and be able to use it like you use tamoxifen, and they did not show any benefits. So this is something that most breast oncologists will not offer their patients as an option. So the question is, so the question is, if you're on a Rimidex, which currently the guidelines until today, a New England Journal article that just came out, uh, is that the recommended treatment has been typically for five years. Now there are going to be questions about whether that should be longer in terms of breast cancer-free survival. Um, but if it's five years, the idea is when people come to see me, if there's an inciting cause such as steroid use or Rimidex, we use the drug during that time. Or for people who have undergo organ transplant, it's really important during the time of transplant to protect the bones. But once the inciting events are over, then I think the idea is that you would come off therapy. So the question is, what are my thoughts about testosterone and increasing bone density? Um, so I have to pause a second because, so this is coming from a woman, and usually I hear questions about testosterone uh, from men, but uh, I I think that um, uh, I'll have to uh, <clears throat> say that from my own point of view, I tend to be a minimalist, and I do not think the data on testosterone in terms of bone density uh, for females or males right now is really uh, the uh, indicated compared to what other data we have currently available that shows clear fracture prevention and increased bone density.
So the question is, are there differences in the, uh, the formulations for Synthroid or thyroid hormone? And, and then I was going to say, that has no relevance to what we're talking about. But then you snuck in that, the comment about um, on bone density. I think the main thing with regards to thyroid disease and bone density is that you don't want to be oversuppressed if possible. And um, there are definitely reports in terms of talking about generics versus um, brand names. And I would say, based on what I've heard, um, the, the thyroid hormone replacements are one of those more uh, tightly regulated drugs that you, you, get, you, you can make an argument for being very, very specific in what you take. And, um, but in terms of how we follow that, it's through the, the measurement of the thyroid stimulating hormone. And that can be measured regardless of what you're on. And you really just don't want to be oversuppressed. Well, so the question was, I don't hear you talk about bisphosphonate holiday and how long one should be on a holiday. And you're absolutely correct, because there was, I only had an hour. <laughs> And um, so that is something that uh, generally, I think people who've been on a lendronate, I mean, the data are there that suggest that five years, I mean, for some people, if they remain at low fracture risk or not having fractures, then woohoo, you got a long vacation. But if there's evidence of a continuing bone loss, increased fracture risk, you're falling down, you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, then the game's over. You probably should consider possibly another tre a treatment, not necessarily with um, bisphosphonate again, but some something for osteoporosis. So the question was, can you comment on um, hormone replacement, uh, especially if you have a uterus and then need to be on progesterone as well? I think that uh, I didn't discuss that due to time limitations, but the, uh, you know, the data from the WHI trial to say, uh, d definitely supported this idea that hormone replacement definitely helps bones and prevents fractures. So um, the answer is uh, yes. So the question is, if you have osteopenia versus osteoporosis, would, would I consider that person at high risk? That's when you start looking at a lot of different other factors. You look at family history. You look at comorbidities. You look at um, how well the person's moving, whether they've had falls in the past year, whether they have a fear of falls, those kinds of things. And all of those factors um, help decide whether or not someone might need to be on treatment. So I think we're just at about 7 o'clock. So I want to thank you for your terrific questions and also for your attention.